you're exerting yourself maximally, and you're barely able to complete the rep. Which rep do you think obviously would be the most productive in terms of stimulating an increase in strength and size, TC? Well, the last one, of course. If you could curl 120 pounds for 10 reps and you only did one rep, you think you'd ever grow? No. If you could curl 120 pounds for 10 reps and you only ever did six, do you think you'd ever grow? No. So what is the stimulus? What is the workload that serves to induce muscular hypertrophy? It's the last rep of a set carried to failure. Okay. This is the important point. Sometimes I get phone consultation clients calling me back in two weeks saying, oh, gee, Mike, they're, they're actually quite anxious. They, they think I'm going to get angry and reach through the phone and wring their neck. They'll say, Mike, I, I tried to stay to the program, but I gave, it, I gave in to that temptation. I did one set. I wanted to do another set so bad, I just felt like I needed another set. And I said to him, well, sir, you used the word felt. What did you feel? And he couldn't, he couldn't identify the feeling. The feeling, in fact, was fear and uncertainty. We didn't send men to the moon based on vague feelings. If you don't use your theoretical knowledge and apply it with 100% consistency, listener, you're never going to achieve bodybuilding success. Yes, I told him, of course you felt like you could do another set. In fact, if I stuck a shotgun up your butt, you'd be here in the gym for three days training nonstop. A bodybuilding workout is not an endurance contest. Then I pointed out, look, the specific stimulus that triggers the growth machinery into motion is that last rep of a set carried to failure. And beyond that, once you have achieved growth stimulation on that last rep, you don't have to do it again. <laughs> this is the fallacy. This is the mistake. All right, let me bring in a quote from a third party here. This is a, Are you familiar with Charles Pollican? He's an Olympic strength coach. What's his name? Charles Pollican. He's a Canadian strength coach. He's coach. rings the bell. Okay. Well, he had this to say regarding high-intensity high training. He says he doubts that it works as a year-in, year-out training method. He says that strength gains are correlated with total motor unit activation, and he doesn't think one set to failure training will get you to recruit all the motor units available. Well, actually, I've got a, uh, I've got a response to that here. Okay. In fact, it's from one of your listeners, TC, but, or not listeners, but readers. Okay. Bill Phillips took the time last week to send me a couple letters from your readers in response to uh, the stuff in your magazine about me. Can I, can I read this to you quickly? Sure. Dear Bill, I have just renewed my subscription to Muscle Media 2000, and I am presently recovering from a heavy-duty workout. Yes, Menser's hot. However, I am not writing this letter to give Menser praise. I am writing this letter to thank him for saving my life. Overtraining was literally killing me. At best, my yearly gains were marginal, and I was constantly plagued by fatigue, minor injuries, and flu-like symptoms. I attempted to induce gains by adding calories, but I only got fat, so I looked worse. Heavy-duty training was my last resort. I figured that I might as well give it a shot since I had nothing to lose. Hell, I didn't gain from what I was doing anyway. To make a long story short, intense heavy-duty trading works. It's brief, effective, and it doesn't fry your nervous system. Thanks again, and tell Mike to keep up the good work. Yours very truly, Sean Jones. P.S. This is the point. P.S. If people doubt the effectiveness of Mentor's theories, maybe they can talk to one of his most famous trainees. You know, Dorian, what's his name? <laughs> when people bring up a, a hypothetical objection to high-intensity training stating it cannot or does not work, I, I become a little bit bored by those people. You know, we have this thing called reality and evidence. It worked for Dorian Yates, Aaron Baker, David Durth, David Paul, Mike Menser, Roland Kickinger, and an untold number of thousands and thousands of others. It does work. Yes, it does build strength, but that is a prerequisite for building size. Remember back in high school, TC, either you or one of your friends had a broken arm. They put it in a cast. After three or four weeks, they take the cast off, and the first thing you notice is your arm shriveled up, the muscle atrophied. What 
is the first thing the physical therapist does to build up the muscle? He gives you strength training exercises, for Christ's sake. If you want to get bigger, you got to get stronger. Yes, heavy-duty training is essentially a strength training program, but you cannot get bigger without getting stronger. When a muscle atrophies, it gets weaker. When it hypertrophies, it gets stronger. There is a relationship between strength and size. Okay, great. Is that sufficient answer? Sure, okay. Uh, let's get a little bit more simplistic here. What are your views regarding uh, like free, free weights compared to machines? Uh, do you have any preferences? Is it necessary to well, use free weights always? If you were to believe the, the manufacturers of free weights, PC, you would have the idea that mankind has benefited enormously in every aspect of his life due to scientific technology and mechanization in every aspect of his existence except bodybuilding. As a body, now here's the most important point perhaps. Again, PC and dear listener, as a bodybuilder, obviously your primary goal is not merely to handle heavy weights once again, as I said before, but to achieve high intensity muscular contraction. When you're doing a, uh, an incline press with a free bar, for instance, PC, a certain significant portion of your focus and effort is diverted away from moving the resistance towards the problems of balance and coordination. And to the extent that your attention is diverted from the resistance towards the problems of balance and coordination, you make the exercise that much less effective in terms of achieving a high-intensity muscular contraction. I have my in-the-gym clients use a, a guided mechanism, an incline press machine or a Smith machine, so that none of their energy, effort, or focus is wasted even slightly towards the problems of balance and coordination. In other words, all of their effort is directed merely against the resistance so they can achieve a maximum contraction of the muscle. That's the best answer by far. No one can possibly refute the validity of that statement. Okay. Well, what? they can refute it, but it will not be. <laughs> it, won't, right. it won't work. All right. I don't, you know, it, it's really a very interesting thing. We did have this thing called the Industrial Revolution, which followed from the Enlightenment. It's, what, it's one of the things that makes our country and Western civilization so superior to the rest of the world. And yet bodybuilders seem to forget that. Yes, I love machines. I love my car. I love my electric lights. I love my video, my 50-inch TV, hot and cold running water. I love the dentist and his drill. I love the surgeon and his tools. Okay. All right. Where would you rather live? In the, in the United States of America where we have all of these wonderful creature comforts or in India where people are still walking around starving and dying at the age of 13? Nope due to dehydration because they reject Western science. <laughs> Point well taken. Okay. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you train your abs and calves in the same manner? Do they respond the same way to high-intensity training? <laughs> exactly. Especially with regards to the abs. A lot of people are obsessed with training their abs. They think that performing endless numbers of sit-ups will somehow whittle away the fat on the abs, which, of course, is ridiculous. There is no such thing, listener, as a a localized fat loss, and you cannot achieve even generalized fat loss by exercise alone. The losing of body fat is contingent primarily upon calories. If you're consuming less calories than you need for maintenance, your body will be forced to revert to its fat stores for energy. And over a period of time, you will see fat loss from all areas of the body, including the abs. And beyond that, the abdominals, understand, are skeletal muscles, just like your pectorals, your latissimus, your biceps, your triceps. Therefore, they respond to the same type of stimulus, high-intensity training in, sh in little amounts. Now, the old, the old uh, saying that the calves are stubborn because we run, we walk, we climb stairs, therefore they need more work, is the most ridiculous argument of all. If overtraining is the problem, how can overtraining be the solution? What the calves require is not more work, PC, but a radically different type of work, a radical departure in the type of activity they're commonly exposed to. They need very 
very intense heavy training. And because they're already overtrained, you got to be very careful. The calves require less work than every other body part, not more. In other words, if overtraining is the problem, and you're suggesting more training is the solution, that's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. Okay. okay. There are people who will try it. There are people who will try it. As Arthur Jones said years ago, Mike, don't ask me to explain the actions of irrational people. <laughs> you can't explain irrationality of that sort. Some people are just so stupid, they've never learned anything even slightly about the nature of knowledge, logic, or its application. There are, there are those people for whom you can draw a picture on a wall that a blind man or an idiot can see, but this poor son of a bitch just turns his head. Okay, okay. In fact, Dorian Yates and I, whenever Dorian Yates comes over here and I train him, we go out to dinner, we chuckle. He says, Mike, when are these guys going to realize that we're, we're over here holding up the light and that it truly is the light? Why do they continue to insist in crawling backwards towards the darkness? And then I, I told him what Arthur Jones says, Dorian, if I could explain the actions of irrational people, they wouldn't be irrational. <laughs> all right, all right. Some people just don't value logic. For some people, the argument that two and two was four just goes right over their head. They would okay. rather be off over here going to a dance party at the nightclub or snorting cocaine or uh, watching the, the same rerun of Laverne and Shirley for the 58th <laughs> time rather than pick up a philosophy book by Ayn Rand and learn how to think. Okay. You, you've never discussed uh, uh, diet in bodybuilding. Maybe that's because we haven't asked you, but uh, I get the idea that you think diet is a little bit overrated. Well, it's not overrated. It's there are certain aspects of it that are inordinately emphasized. Actually, this is a very interesting one. As much confusion as there does exist on the subject of, of training, and we all know it's enormous, the subject of nutrition is, is even more confusing for most people. But in fact, and most interesting, the subject of nutrition is actually very simple. And I am not seeking to oversimplify it even slightly. I am not seeking to oversimplify it even slightly, listener, when I say that with regards to nutrition, all you really have to be concerned with is in making a reasonable effort on a daily basis to obtain a well-balanced diet. A well-balanced diet, by definition, is one that provides your body with all the nutrients it needs. Let me restate that. A well-balanced diet, by definition, is one that provides your body with all the nutrients it needs. Now, let's focus on the key concept there, need or need. It is a term that reverberates throughout the entire realm of biology. If you've ever studied biology, sociology, psychology, you've come across the word need and how important a role it plays. A very important aspect of biology of crucial concern to all those listening, of course, is nutrition. The concept of need in the context of nutrition implies a limit that cannot be transcended. Let's say, for instance, TC, you need 25 milligrams of vitamin D. I'm sorry, vitamin C. And that's true according to all of your reputable, and I emphasize the word reputable, according to all of your reputable nutritional scientists, all you need is 25 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Now, let's say all of a sudden you start taking a vitamin C supplement that provides you with as much as 3,000 milligrams a day. That will not force your body to utilize even one more milligram than it needs or 26. Again, in the context of nutrition, the concept of need implies a limit that cannot be transcended. Now, when you drink more water than you need, you obviously just excrete it. You do not have that same luxury with protein, fats, and carbs because they contain calories. What happens when you consume?